فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحوم كالطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روبا الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My brothers, my sisters I'm very happy to be here this morning and uh, I was very excited to actually come uh, to meet you and I'm so happy I was telling Brother Wail moments ago that if the number of people is less it's better for us we can interact a little bit more perhaps we can get a chance to meet one another uh, I would like to meet you perhaps more than you would like to meet me the only thing is sometimes it becomes difficult when the numbers are too big and it becomes a little bit uh, of a hazard as well sometimes. Uh, I spoke in Melbourne a few days ago and I made mention of how we will not be achieving salvation by just shaking somebody's hand. But it is a good deed at the end of the day where if you can, you may want to meet one another. More important than that is to make a dua for one another. Uh, so inshallah, I hope we get an opportunity to, to, to interact a little bit more, at least to greet each other by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to uh, speak about something very, very important. You see, we were meant to kick off at 9.30. But as you notice, uh, we're a little bit delayed. It's okay. Because the AIC has something unique in it. You know, the AIC is the Australian Islamic College. Islamic College. It has something unique in it. Two of the teachers are called Wa'il. Okay? So I didn't suffice by waiting just for a while. I had to wait for two whiles. <laughs> That's why we're late. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. I hope that wasn't a granddad joke, but anyway, uh, you might have understood it, right? Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, brother Wa'il, mashallah. So let's get a little bit more serious. In life, in life, it's important for us to get involved. Tonight, I will be speaking about a lot of this involvement and we're concentrating on leaving a legacy by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for now, I want to tell you that do you know that whenever there is something good to be done, there is a small part of you that tells you to do it. Sometimes that becomes a big part of you, depending on your closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and depending also on how you have allowed yourself to progress and look at matters over time. And when there is something bad to be done, a small part of you tells you to look into it, perhaps to do it. Sometimes a big part, depending on how you've trained yourself and how distant you are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes when a good thing is there to be done, a little part of you tells you not to do it, to stay away from it, to abstain. And it fluctuates. All of this is opportunity from Allah. There is a war that is happening between the good force and the bad force within you. So there are angels that are trying to encourage you to do good and there is a qareen or a shaitan that is trying to encourage you to do bad. Whenever there is good, shaitan tells you don't do it. Whenever there is bad, shaitan tells you do it. And the angels are exactly the opposite. So my brothers and sisters, what you need to ask yourself is in your life, who have you allowed to be victorious? Is it the angelic, the proper force, the good force? Or is it the devil, the demonic or the satanic force? If there is something evil, something evil that you find yourself constantly going towards, then you need to strengthen yourself. It's called your nafs, yourself, your soul. You need to strengthen it in a way that you become a person who, by the help of Allah, realizes that that's not going to get you anyway. 
A person who's addicted to something. I want to give you a good example. Smoking. Smoking is a good example. The reason is, everyone admits, including the non-Muslims, that it's a bad habit. In fact, you're not allowed to sell a cigarette without declaring on it, declaration. It kills. Okay? If you don't even think about it, and if you think to yourself, it's not bad, it's okay, these people are just talking, I have another fatwa from another scholar somewhere else, who, who's probably smoking by the way, uh, who says that, nah, it's okay, it's makru, it's fine, it's fine, you know, it's not a big deal. Then, are you ever going to eradicate that habit? The answer is no, because you haven't even thought of it. You have a bad habit, and you don't even think you have a bad habit. You see? But if you thought about it, then what will happen? You need to control your nafs in order to be able to win that wrestling match or the battle between the two forces within you. And this is when you will be able to succeed. Otherwise, it's not coming. You know the boxers. The boxers who are, subhanallah, in the ring. How much do they train? What do they want to do? They want to knock out their opponent. They have to train, they have to work hard, they have to control themselves, they are disciplined, they will work. That is when they will knock out their opponent in the ring. Trust me, shaitan is a bigger enemy than anyone could be in a boxing ring. And it requires, or he requires, much more of our power, dedication, and training in order to be knocked out than someone who's just a boxer. So, make an effort. We always say, what's the point of having huge muscles when you haven't even tackled shaitan? Allahu Akbar. Shaitan. Allah says, Inna kayda shaytani kana da'ifa. The plot of the devil is so weak, but you're becoming weaker than the devil. Just be a little bit strong, you overcome the devil. Big muscles, mashallah, huge, big guys. Protein, day and night, mashallah. I hope it's not just injecting something, subhanallah. Otherwise your muscles might pop, subhanallah. But no matter how big you look, subhanallah, ask yourself, can I even tackle what Allah calls weak shaitan? I can't even tackle the devil. Do you remember in the past I said, if you think you're strong, if you think you're strong, you would only be a strong person if you were able to lift your blanket for Salatul Fajr. I'm sure you've heard that, right? If you can lift your blanket for Salatul Fajr, you are strong. But if you can lift 100 kilos, 200 kilos, that's nothing because the blanket, too heavy for you, right? Too heavy. So the strongest person is the one, come Salatul Fajr, ugh, you put your blanket up and you push it aside. Similarly, a strong mu'min is he who's able or she who's able to fight bad habits. We are human beings. We will have a few habits that are not so good. We can have bad habits on condition that it's not something that we have become oblivious of. We're working on it. We're trying to eradicate it. So a brother will tell you, and even a sister who's smoking, she'll tell you, you know what? Sorry, I have to give that example because I've seen some sisters smoke. Mashallah. Astaghfirullah. Okay. So she will tell you that, you know what? I used to smoke 20. Then I started smoking 15. And now, alhamdulillah, I'm at 10. Wait, hang on. Say, Alhamdulillah, Astaghfirullah, I'm at 10. Use both, not just Alhamdulillah. Because if you say, Alhamdulillah, I'm at 10, what will happen is, you're happy that you're at 10 and you think you've achieved from 20, I cut it down to half. So shaitan makes you think, right, that's okay, you've already done it, you've achieved. No, Alhamdulillah that I've cut half, and Astaghfirullah, I'm not even supposed to be on these 10. You see? So Alhamdulillah, Astaghfirullah, and if you're really dedicated, Alhamdulillah, Astaghfirullah, inshallah, I'm at 10. That means, the inshallah means I'm going to quit that 10 as well. The, the issue here is dedication. Wallahi, if you're not dedicated and you're not focused, you will never achieve. A person who's delaying salah, for example, every time you, you haven't read your salah, you're lazy, uh, you go to work, you forget about salah, a week goes by, the only salah you've read is salat al-jumu'ah, and that too you arrived late and you left first, subhanallah. I can tell you something interesting about that type of a person. If that person feels within himself, I need to do something about this, it's the rahmah of Allah. It's the rahmah of Allah. But if that person does not feel within themselves that they need to do something about it, then it is definitely something very bad. You will lose. You are the only one who's going to lose. No one else. 
So when a person has not fulfilled their duty unto Allah, but they are trying their best to change that way and habit, it's a good thing. Alhamdulillah, don't lose focus, remain focused. Yesterday, someone sent me, and I'm sorry to give you this example, but I will because this is what a lot of people might relate to. Someone sent me a little clip about the history of Phelps. You know who's Phelps? Who's Phelps? The swimmer. I think he broke so many world records. Do you agree? Do you know that when he started off, he was actually scared of water? He was scared of water. And do you know that after he did very well initially, he slipped into drugs and he almost lost himself. And one day, something clicked in him and he says, no, I want to go back and I want to give it my, I want to do one last race and I'm going to give it everything I have. That last race ended up in him becoming the world champion. Not just once, but I think he struck gold more than 28 times. Why am I telling you this? Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. What you've done, where you've been, what has been happening, it becomes irrelevant the moment you turn to Allah. It becomes irrelevant. Then what happens? Shaitan comes to you with something else. What does he say? He says to you, you changed your life. But you were too, too bad for Allah to have totally forgiven you. So now you start doubting the mercy of Allah. My brothers, my sisters, the biggest insult at that juncture while you are seeking forgiveness would be to doubt the mercy of Allah. I said it yesterday. I'm saying it again today. Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say to my worshippers, O oh my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves, never ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah. He will forgive all your sins because He is most forgiving, most merciful. That's the verse. What does Allah say? Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. So Shaytan knows that now that you want to turn towards Allah, He's going to come to you from a different door and tell you that you know what? You are a little bit too far out of the reach of the mercy of Allah. Then when you've engaged in tawbah, he makes you think, no, your tawbah is not accepted. Yours is not. That's shaitan. If you think your tawbah is not accepted, it's shaitan. Unless you were not sincere when you sought the forgiveness of Allah. You seek the forgiveness of Allah. And sometimes what happens, a person seeks the forgiveness of Allah with all the four conditions. What are the four conditions? You admit, you regret, you ask for forgiveness and you promise not to do it again. Four conditions. Beautiful. Easy to remember because the sequence is common logic. I admit I did wrong. I regret it. I'm not excited about it. I ask Allah, oh Allah, forgive me. And I say, oh Allah, I won't do it again. Right? For as long as those conditions were met at the time of seeking forgiveness and you were serious, the sin is wiped out. One more condition and that is for as, for as long as the sin was not committed against a fellow human being. Because you cannot go and steal $20,000 from someone and then say, Oh Allah, I admit, I regret, seek forgiveness, won't do it again. But anyway, this 20 is mine. <laughs> that is foolish because if it's against a fellow human being, you need to clear it with them. Go back and donate the 20 back to them. Say, look, I'm sorry, this is what happened and there it goes. You know? So you ask Allah's forgiveness. Yes, indeed. If you're genuine, He has forgiven you. Don't doubt it. Sometimes, because you're a human being, you might falter again. A person makes tawbah to Allah to say, I'll never miss a salah again. And they do not miss a salah. But then what happens is, sometimes, somewhere down the line, one salah gets clicked out of the timing. 
You feel immediate regret again. This is the second time it's happening. So what do you do? You make your qaba. You make your missed prayer immediately as soon as you remember. You make your qaba. And what do you do? You promise again, Oh Allah, forgive me. I Really, this was something very, very bad. I don't want to do it again. It's okay. Allah will forgive you a second time. Sometime about a month later, two months later, you missed another one. Again, you go back to Allah, oh Allah, forgive me. I didn't really mean to do this, but it happened. So it's not you and yourself and your habit and your quality anymore. Now it's just a blunder, an error. It's a mistake. And if you fall back into a situation where you have gone back to missing your prayer wholesale, my brothers, my sisters, quickly come back to Allah and seek His forgiveness again. He will forgive you another time. Again. And a few years down the line, you fell into the same thing again. You know what? Quickly go back to Allah, seek His forgiveness again. He will forgive you a third time. So the question is, how many times will He forgive me? How many times? The answer is, Allah continues to forgive you for as long as you continue to sincerely repent to Him. If you were genuine each time you sought the forgiveness of Allah, he will forgive you unlimited. So much so that there is a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ reports to us what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watches his worshippers seeking forgiveness and falling back into the same sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta says to his angels, You see my worshipper seeking forgiveness, falling back. And seeking forgiveness again and falling back and seeking forgiveness again and falling back not as a joke but seriously seeking forgiveness again what do you think that I should do to him the angels would say you are the most forgiving so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says my worshipper has realized and believes firmly that he has a Lord, he has a Rabb whom he is answerable to, who can either forgive him or punish him. And therefore he keeps seeking my forgiveness. I want you to bear witness, O oh my angels, that I have forgiven him completely. Subhanallah. Why? Because now you have confirmed you believe in Allah. That's why the hadith says, إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَتُكَ وَسَاءَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكَ فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنٍ When your good deed makes you feel good and your bad deed makes you regret, it's a sign that you are a true believer. If you were not a believer, you would not consider bad as bad. If you are not a believer, when you did bad, you would not bat an eyelid. For you, you would look forward to doing it again. But if you're a believer, you committed a sin, and after that you say, I shouldn't have done that. That's a sign of Iman. It's a sign that there is some deity that you actually are afraid of. Right? It's a sign that you have a Lord you are answerable to. So you did a sin and you say, Astaghfirullah, I shouldn't. It was a waste of time, money, effort, energy, and I achieved nothing besides disaster. If that happens to you, good news to you, you're a mu'min. It's a sign that you have belief. Your candle is still flickering. MashaAllah. So quickly come out and make sure the wind does not blow out that candle. Make sure that that candle can actually be shining bright. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a good sign. But if you're not going to make an effort to turn to Allah, nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's not just going to come to you just like that. I was saying shaitan comes to a person. Firstly, he beautifies haram. Beautifies. And yet it's not as beautiful as he makes it out to be. It's photoshopped. Right? So, shaitan beautifies haram in a way that you want to do it. And shaitan makes it seem difficult to fulfill the simple things that Allah asks you to fulfill, starting with salah. 
That's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about some of the sins, He speaks about consumption of alcohol, gambling, etc., doing things that are unacceptable in the eyes of Allah. And He says, this is from the handiwork of the devil, you better be careful and leave it. That's what He says. And after that, He says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَن يُوقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ وَيَصُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ Indeed, shaitan's intention, shaitan wants to instill between you hatred. When you start hating your brother, remember it's shaitan at work. When you start hating your sister, your spouse, your family members, your community members, your fellow believers, the people in the masjid and the others, it's shaitan at work. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانِ أَنْ يُوْقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةِ Indeed, it is part of the plan of shaitan to instill and to inculcate or to make and create between you an enmity. So watch out. When there is enmity, fight it. Put your ego on one side, sort the problem out. Say, I'm sorry. When there is a problem, put your ego on one side, your pride, put it away and say, I'm sorry. Sort it out because why? Shaitan's one of his first steps Allah speaks about in the Quran. What does he want? Yuridu an yuqi'a baynakumul adawa. He wants to create between you enmity. So that your life is stressed, depressed, so that you go further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happens? The others also are angry, depressed, there is hatred, there is no harmony, no contentment. Everyone is fighting, and that's what shaitan loves. So when there is a problem, if you're a mu'min, strive. Strive to solve it. Even if it means you compromised a little bit here and there of your own perhaps. A little bit here and there. You might have to say, it's okay, I'm sorry. Yet you know deep down, it might not have totally been your fault. But imagine, I am sorry. Made up of three words. If that can solve a huge problem, huh, say it, come on. Say it. Some of you must be thinking, no, no. I'm not going to say, look, I don't know how big your problem is. If it is a massive problem, perhaps you might want to take it a little bit further. You know, you might not want to apologize. You may, you, so I, I'm not sort of issuing a blanket ruling on everyone's case because I don't know the particular cases, but it's just a general encouragement as far as possible. Sort it out. Then the, then the same verse continues to say that... يَصُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ Shaytan's other plan is he wants to divert you from the remembrance of Allah and prayer. Prayer. So if a person doesn't pray, it's shaytan's initial kick and you're already falling. Subhanallah. One knockout blow, gone. Two blows, out. If you watch, for example, the big boxers, and if there is someone who really is not such a big champ and they are going to fight with them, you know what will happen? They will go in, subhanallah. And as they enter the, the, this, this, uh, as they enter the ring, one blow and the guy's out. They call it the knockout. The shortest, the shortest fight in history was only a few seconds. Do you know that? A few seconds. They went in, punch, punch, and the man was down on the ground. That's what happens to us with shaitan. He does it all the time, shorter than that. Not punch, punch, but one punch. And by the way, in Sydney, there's a place called Punch Bowl. MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us uh, goodness. I, initially, I didn't know what it meant, but I think it's a bowl of like mixed fruit juices and all that. Is that punch? It's called a punch, right? Wallahu alam. Some people are nodding, some people are shaking. It's okay, it's fine. We're allowed to disagree on that. It's the name of an area in Sydney. That's muttafaq alayhi, inshaAllah. Okay. So... My beloved brothers and sisters, don't let shaitan knock you out. If you did something bad, give him back a punch. How do you give him a punch? You give him a punch by proving him that you are closer to Allah than he wants you to be. Then shaitan wants you. Shaitan wants you to be far away, right? You are closer to Allah than what shaitan wants. So what will you do? He might have succeeded. He gave you a little punch, second punch. So you missed a salah. Hey, you got up and you made your qada. Qada is a punch. 
in the face of shaitan. If you read your missed salah, that you missed, say for example, man nama an salatin aw nasiyaha, fal yusalliha idha dhakaraha. The hadith says, whoever slept over a prayer or forgot it, they need to read it as soon as they remember. If you did that, what did you do? You punched the devil one time, big punch. And guess what? I guarantee you, I'm speaking in the house of Allah to those who believe when you do a good deed between you and Allah, it's automatic. Your iman shows by you feeling so calm. You feel good. You get up for Salatul Fajr early and you decide today I'm going to go to the masjid. And even if the masjid is far, you decide today I'm going to fulfill my salah on time with a smile. So you get up, Alhamdulillah, thank Allah. You make your wudu, no matter how cold or whatever the temperature may be. And you stand in, on your prayer mat and you just say, Allahu Akbar. And you complete your salah. How do you feel? How do you feel? Tell me, how do you feel? Don't you feel good about it? Don't you feel that, mashallah, I thank Allah for giving me this chance and opportunity? Right? It's a sign of iman. In the same way that your sin made you regret, now your good deed is making you feel good. When you seek Allah's forgiveness, oh Allah, forgive me, and you shed a tear, wallahi, it's a good sign of iman, your closeness to Allah. Allah loves you, He makes you feel the goodness. And this is why the people who have followed their whims and fancies go and study them, see them. Those whose lives have been filled with doing what they want without considering what Allah wants. They're depressed. I have done my own little study of a lot of famous people across the globe. Did you know that more than 60% of them are on antidepressants and sleeping tablets? Did you know that? And yet the world follows them completely. Wow. Yay. Even the singers and the pop stars and a lot of the movie stars. Movie stars, you have a few who might be a little bit more decent, subhanAllah. But... A lot of the others, they are depressed, they are sad, they, their life, they, they realize at a certain point that you know what, life cannot just be all about this. Ask those young people who used to spend every weekend in the clubs, who, the young people who used to do all the evil every time and they never turned to Allah. It was all about drinking, womanizing, clubbing, etc, etc. If you are a mu'min, there comes a time in your life when you realize, Ya Allah, this is not what life is all about. There is a bigger purpose to all of this. And then it brings you to Allah. And guess what? The first thing it does for you, it calms you down. Completely, totally calm. I've actually studied some of the incarcerated in the prisons. Those who were hardcore criminals and those who turned to Allah from amongst them. Cool, calm, relaxed. Even the wardens are surprised. They say, these people were hardcore. Look at this. Their deen, their religion, the fact that they turned to Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala They've become calm people. They put their head on the ground when we watch it. I remember one guy telling me this. He says, when we watch them, we feel, wow, what a transformation. What a transformation. Who transformed you? Allah. Why? Allah says that if you come to me a hand span, I come to you a whole foot. If you come to me walking, I will come to you rushing. That's Allah's promise. So my brothers and sisters, the message I have for you is, just make an effort, small effort. Something good to be done, make an effort. The rest will be done. Something bad to be done, stay away. There's a powerful dua that I keep on reading and I, it's a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu I mentioned it recently on one of my Insta live sessions. Allahum makfini bi halalika an haramik wa ghnini bi fadlika amman siwak. Allahum makfini bi halalika an haramik you know what it means? Oh Allah, make halal sufficient for me to the degree that I don't go to haram. So you're content with halal. So that you don't have to go to haram. Oh Allah, make halal enough for me, sufficient for me. So that I don't have to venture into haram and fall into haram. And oh Allah, make me through your virtue, through your virtue, independent in a way that I don't depend on anyone besides you. Which means Allah provide for me in a way that I don't have to ask anyone else. Just you. So Allah provides for you and He protects you from haram. 
So what happens? When you keep asking Allah, Oh Allah, protect me from haram, and you are serious about it, whenever you have planned something haram, Allah will create some barrier between you and that haram. It won't happen. Or it will be difficult. There will be an obstacle. Something will crop up. Something will come up. And just it won't happen. You plan the haram. You plan to go clubbing, for example, or whatever it was. And you know what? Something comes in your direction and you just realize, subhanallah, this is Allah telling me don't go and you don't go. Or you, you're tired. Suddenly there is a, a flat and you need to repair it and time is up and over. Suddenly someone comes to the house and you needed to leave, but you can't. So Allah sent someone to say, go and sit at this guy's house at 4.30, just before he's going to be going out for the evening. So now they go, say, welcome, welcome. And in the back of your mind, you say, I wish you weren't here, you know. But Alhamdulillah, that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was Allah who sent them there in order to save you from haram. Now, and I want to end with this, inshallah, I've spoken for half an hour. Remember one last thing. When there is a good cause, when there is a good cause, try and be a part of it. Even if it's a small part. Even if it ultimately means through the dua that you've made for that good cause. We cannot solve the world's problems, but do you agree there are many problems across the globe? Issues that frustrate us across the globe. We want to see peace, we want to see goodness, we want to see solution, we want to see the stopping of the killing and the hunger and the, the stopping of the destruction and everything else. But can I tell you what? When there is a good cause, firstly, you start by improving your own self so that your dua becomes powerful. So people say, why is it that Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah will not change the condition of a nation until and unless they don't change themselves individually, each one of them. People say, well, you know what, if Allah wanted, He would change it. Can I tell you? You want to make a dua to Allah, in order to answer that dua, you need to be close to Allah. You need to try to get slightly closer to Allah than you are. Not every one of us is as close as each other to Allah. We don't know, but within you, you know that I'm better today than I was yesterday. That's a good sign. So when you've just read your salah, when you've just made tawbah, and then you say, Oh Allah, forgive all these people. Oh Allah, help them, guide them. Oh Allah, resolve this matter. Help the people here and there. I promise you that dua is far more valuable than a dua you would make while you were far away from Allah. You know when you have a friend trying to get close to you, they've helped you, etc. Then they say, you know what? Uh, I just need your help for five minutes. What are you going to say? Oh yeah, I'll give you ten minutes, man. Because they're close to you. Right? If they're very close to you, you can even fly them down from somewhere, tell them that, you know what? I need you right here, right now. They'll say, I'm catching the next flight. Because they're very close to you. That is the example of a human being. The example of Allah is far higher than that. If you try to get close to Allah, I promise you, He says, I will come closer to you than you have come to me. For as long as you're heading in this direction, right direction. So in order to resolve matters and problems, we start with ourselves. Secondly, we make dua. Thirdly, give something. Try and help. You know, every one of us has issues, problems, difficulties, financial obligations. A lot of the times people ask us, moments ago we heard that, you know, the events that are happening here in Perth, the proceeds will be going to the Philippines perhaps, right? They will be going to the Philippines for... Uh, da'wah purposes for purposes of alleviation of whatever else that is there and we heard how $50 can feed in the Philippines in some parts of the Philippines $50 can actually feed a family of three for a whole month okay we can calculate that calculation in the other way we say $50 can feed 10 families three meals subhanallah here in Perth, I think that will just take me to royal stacks. That's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Is there royal stacks in Perth? Anyone? Well, then it, you will have to fly to Melbourne because we tasted some really nice burgers there. MashaAllah. Okay, so you may not be able to give so much. Give something. Minimum, make a dua. Say something. Do something. You know why? If you don't, it's okay. 
But the work will continue without you. I'd rather have my one dollar there and say, Alhamdulillah, may Allah accept it. Who knows which one is going to be that investment that's going to take me to Jannatul Firdaus. Who knows which one? No one knows. So you'd rather put your investments here, there, there, the other place, the third place, the fourth place, everywhere else. And now I actually know that subhanallah, every good that's happening, I have a small share in it. If one of them is going to take all the way to Jannah, all the people who invested in it, well, I'm one of them, subhanallah. You see, I remember there was a brother who refused to give money after he had pledged to a certain masjid. So they were building the masjid and he had pledged an amount. Based on his pledge, the people were excited. They gave a contract, they did this, they did that. A little while later, he changed his mind. And when people went to him and said, Brother, you gave a pledge, it's the house of Allah. He says, I changed my mind. I'm allowed to change my mind. I'm a human, I hadn't yet given it. Guess what? The masjid was built without his money. And it became even better than they initially planned. And there was supposed to be a few big donors. Instead, the community got involved. And everyone gave a little bit here and there. And you know what? Because everyone gave a little bit, everyone came to the masjid because it was one a masjid that they were involved in somehow. And the masjid was a huge and still is a huge success story. And right at the end, when the whole project was over, this wealthy man came back with a fat check and he told the committee of the masjid, give the people back their money, here is the money. Wallahi, it's a true story. They laughed at him. They laughed at him because one of the scholars told them, when Allah doesn't want someone's money in his house, he will throw it out. And this person won't even know that my money was rejected. you will be excited about it. Maybe you had an argument, maybe something happened. Brother, that's a good cause. The house of Allah, give. Give. You might not be able to give so much. Give a little bit. Give a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. You know what I always say, and I want to say it again. I mentioned it at the Newport Masjid, a beautiful masjid in Melbourne. Lovely. They built it lovely. And I mentioned it also in Sydney, at the Punchbowl uh, Masjid. And I'm saying it here again at AIC. Barakallah feekum. Imagine the value of salah. What's the value of your salah? If you were to put uh, amount of Australian dollars on Salat al-Dhuhr, what would you put? How much? What's the amount? So someone says, okay, this salah you're reading, what's the value of it in dollars? What would you say? What would you say? Everyone is saying priceless, right? Priceless. You cannot put a price. You cannot put a figure to the value of your salah. Do you agree? Okay. So you came into the masjid. Listen very carefully. It's a very, very interesting point. You walked into the masjid to do what? To fulfill your salah. MashaAllah. Allahumma iftah li abwaaba rahmatik. Right? Oh Allah, open the doors of mercy for me. And as you came in, you felt good. MashaAllah. What did you do? You quickly rushed because you needed the bathroom. So you used the loo. You came out. MashaAllah. You went and made wudu. MashaAllah. There was warm water there. There was a roll of Kleenex tissues. And mashallah, you used from that and you even used one of the towels and put it into the section that is there for used towels. And subhanallah, you then went, third thing is those dryers that are there. You went there to finish off the drying and the, the wiping of whatever you had that was slightly wet. And you walked out, you came into the masjid and guess what? You turned on the aircon or oh, there was air conditioning in it and beautiful, cool. The lights are on, the aircon is on. Lovely. I came in. I, there was a mushaf on the side. I picked it up. I sat down. I read the Quran. I put it back. I came forward. I sat in the first stop for a little while. The Imam came. The Muaddin came. And he called out the Iqamah. The Imam was in the front. I stood behind there. And guess what I did? I read my Salah. Beautiful. I enjoyed something that was priceless. Absolutely no amount of money can be put and said that it is the value of your prayer. And then what did I do? I greeted the Imam, I greeted the Mu'addin, and I said, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Jazakumullah khair. I'm going out reading a dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik, and I walk out and I'm gone home. What is missing? What is missing? Someone else's money was used in order to facilitate what you just did. Did you ever think of that? 
Have you ever thought of that? Never. Someone else's money put the carpet here. Someone else is paying for the electricity. Someone else is paying for the air conditioning. Someone paid for the sound. Someone's paying the imam and the muaddin. Someone paid for the water you use. Someone paid to clean the loo that you use. Someone paid for the electricity and to wash the towels, the washing machines and whatever else. Someone's paying and you just came in. MashaAllah, you enjoyed. You came in and you never, ever, ever, ever thought of giving one dollar. One. How much? How much? One dollar for the salah that you've read. See what I'm saying? Isn't it a strong point? So when my point is, it's not farah. It's not necessary. Pray for those who made it happen. But get into a habit of sometimes donating in the masajid that you've used. Why should you as a rich man, a person who can afford, a person who doesn't mind going to, 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 to spend money at a restaurant or wherever else or just go on here and there. I'll spend on a holiday and a room and an apartment and whatever else and I'll go and use a massage chair at an airport and I'll put more money in there than I've ever donated to a masjid. Subhanallah, house of Allah. What was it? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who used someone else's money for the upkeep of his own house. I want him to use my money too. And that will only happen if you think about it. Think about it. It's going to carry on without you. It's going to move without you. A good job, a school, a, a good cause, it will go without you. Think about it. Put your money there. And the reason why I say this point, my brothers, my sisters, especially the brothers, we use the facilities. And you know what I've realized? Again, I, I like to talk to people and ask them and so on. I ask the guys in the committees of the mosque, who are the most regulars in this masjid? So they tell you, mashallah, so and so, so and so, so many people, without name sometimes, sometimes they'll tell you who it is. I say, can I just ask you out of interest, just for my own curiosity, who are your biggest donors here? Are they the same people? A lot of the times they are not. A lot of the times the people who make the biggest noise are the guys who are there regularly. But they didn't really contribute in a way, in any way. Subhanallah, they just came there to use facility. For what? Salah. Never ever thought, imagine I'm, I'm a person, I get a salary. I fulfill salah. I'm using water paid for by someone else. I just think it's waqf, but it's actually some person. He might be. Wallahi, one day I cried when I visited India and I saw a poor guy. He was a revert. Really poor guy. And he was putting money in a box. And I thought to myself, that was for the upkeep of the masjid. That is the time when I said to myself, this beggar, this guy who has tatty clothes is paying for the water and electricity used by the who's who wealthy, wealthy dude who's reading salah in the first saf there. And he doesn't know. He doesn't know. Look whose money Allah accepted. 50 cents of that guy, wallahi. For the house of Allah, and here is a guy who can afford to have built that whole masjid. Never thought of giving. Why? Because there's one person in the committee I don't like. So I, until and unless he's not out, I'm not going to give a cent. That's Allah kicking you right out of the masjid. So I think I've said a lot about that point. I think I've driven it home. Uh, the moral of it is let's try and give to a good cause, even if it means a little bit. If you walk out of a masjid, give a little bit perhaps sometimes, especially if it's a masjid you use and you have seen a facility that's not that grand. I remember... Uh, when I traveled from Mecca to Medina, we stopped at a masjid. And trust me, the facilities were not up to scratch. May Allah forgive me and forgive all of us. Uh, people used to make a noise. I used to make a noise. May Allah forgive us. Look, we're human beings. I used to say, look, these, this facility, these guys should do something about it. These guys should do something about it. Not realizing that, you know what? One day there came someone who decided... I'm going to do something about this. And guess what? Go back now. See what's happened. Subhanallah. Go back now. I'm talking of the last six months. See what's happened. It may not be a five-star facility, but there's a big change in the masjids on the way, Mecca to Medina. Within the last six months, there's been a big change. Why? Because for so many years, people used to just complain. Have you been, to, have you been on that road between Mecca and Medina? Yes. Have you seen the condition of the toilets? 
Have you seen the masajid? How dirty, how filthy. Can you, can you imagine? These people are wealthy. These people are this. Look at where, where does their money go, etc. All that is from shaitan. My brother, it's not the solution to the problem. The whole world will talk about it. All you needed to do is to say, I'm doing something about it. Create something, do something, meet a few people, sort things out, get some funding going, get a person to clean the place. And subhanallah, employ some people to be there 24-7 to clear. And you know what? Someone did it. Subhanallah. Someone did it. May Allah give them Jannah. May Allah keep it. Now, we may not need to go as far as Mecca and Medina, but all we need to do is nearby, within our own places, and wherever you hear about a good cause and so on, inshallah, it's, it's a good thing to give. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us to do good and to continue doing good. And within my topic, I did speak about turning to Allah and how not to lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, when you... When you uh, when you help others and when you work towards a good cause, you will also attain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will have mercy on you. Kana Allahu fi awni al-abdi, ma kana al-abdu fi awni akhihi. Allah will continue to assist a slave for as long as that slave continues to assist others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.